Science, and I just wanted to introduce our interviewer for, for the session coming up now. Um, I think in life there are, in your professional life, there are three types of people that you meet. There's people that you work with, there's people that you work with that you like working with, and then there's people that you work with that you like working with that you know, even if you stop working with them, you still like them, still be friends. And James is one of those people for me that I think even when we're old and out of alumni relations, we'll still be friends and you'll be showing me around the, the kosher restaurants in New Orleans and we'll, we'll work it out there. So, so let me give you a little bit of introduction on James as a, as a background. James is currently the, the Vice President for Alumni Relations at Tulane University in, in the United States. Prior to that, James was the uh, Vice Chancellor of Vanderbilt University and previous to that, uh, he was Vice President for Alumni Affairs at the University of California. James is also one of those media stars. You would have seen him in the New York Times earlier this year and he's probably going to be featuring on the BBC this week. So without further ado, I give you James Stefan. James. So I'm honored to be here on, on stage. Of course, I've had a couple of my colleagues come on before me. We have Howard Wolf with his 125 staff members. <laughs> Our good friend from uh, the consulting firm with his 400 visits to uh, alumni uh, from around the country. So um, I do have uh, 16 staff members, or small Tulane, uh, but I've been at Tulane for three years, so I've enjoyed it very much. I would first want to welcome anybody who wants to get to a place with good food, good jazz, uh, to come to Norman. And, it's, and it's, it's pronounced Norman. Not the one you but Norman. But you'll have to come and come over. But I'm really happy to be joining two distinguished colleagues here in our relations. <laughs> Better? Yeah. I'm happy to be joining two good colleagues in our relations who I'm honored to be on stage with. Uh, they come from uh, the corporate world from two distinguished uh, firms. Um, Sean is Global Director of Alumni Relations at McKinsey & Company. Before that, he was at MIT, so he has a bit of a taste of the nonprofit alumni relations world. Leora Singer, Vice President of Alumni Relations Group at Goldman Sachs in New York, and she worked her way up through marketing and communications. So let me first say how honored I am to, to, to join you two. So I haven't done this uh, recently in terms of anything. I've interviewed some deans and some students, but not this large group. So Daniel calls me up, and Robert calls me up and says, Go check out David Frost. So, you know, <laughs> David Frost is a bit, you know, uh, uh, he's not been around recently, so I did check out David Frost. But, um, so I went to a couple of the interviews, and of course he did the famous interview with Nixon, and he got Nixon to apologize, which was pretty amazing. But I said, what do I need to get these two folks to apologize for? They've done really, <laughs> done really well. And then I, I saw an interview with John Lennon and Yoko Ono. I don't know if you saw that in any of you, but you know, it's the time when John Lennon and Yoko Ono were really long hair and, and she was doing her performance art. So they, uh, they come on and, and they, uh, Yoko Ono, before he even introduces them, reaches into her bag and pulls out a box. And she, and she says, we want to give you a smile box. And there's a thread here, so stay with me, okay? <laughs> I want to give you a smile box. So they give the smile box to David Frost. He opens it up, pulls out a mirror. And of course, he says, this is the most beautiful gift I've ever gotten, looking at himself, smiling. <laughs> so the whole concept was to smile. And so I thought, and I know there's a connection here, that many times we're asked to smile no matter what happens in alumni relations. How many times has an alum come up to you disgruntled about whatever it might be? You stand there, you take it, and you smile. And basically, <laughs> it's, 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 it's one of the things we have to do. On top of that, you honor me for being here today. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite an amazing thing that we doubled the size last year. You had twice as many people. So, and I know selfies are a little bit gone already that past eight, but I'd like to take a selfie to send on my Twitter, my Google, my LinkedIn, my WhatsApp, and every other form I can send it. So if you just give me a second, I'm gonna put this on. And I'm gonna include you all and send this to all my, my good staff, et cetera. So, there we go. So smile. Let's do one too. Let's do one too. Very good. Thank you so much. You saw my thoughts about you. <laughs> so I think we have a lot to learn from uh, these two folks today. And I thought we'd start by having them talk about, as we did with some of the other discussions this morning, how they got involved with alumni relations. 
and in particular, maybe about a little bit about the organization and how they, who they report to, et cetera, how many alumni I have. So, Leola, why don't I, Leola, why don't I start with you? Sure. Um... So as I'm just going to echo everyone this morning that said this, was, this role was not something that I kind of woke up at 16 and, and decided that I wanted to do. Um, but I was very lucky and I was working at Goldman for two years in London in the marketing team. Um, there didn't seem to be anywhere within my, my group that I could move up to. And um, as is often the case at Goldman, um, my boss was incredibly supportive of keeping me at the firm and she actually helped me write my resume. Um, rewrite my resume and to stay at the firm. Um, and the woman who employed me in New York was in London for an event. And it was literally a joke. I turned to her and I said, so do you need an analyst in New York? And she said, actually, we're recruiting one. Um, and eight months later, I was in New York doing this role. Um, not something that I ever imagined that I would do, but just really, as somebody else said this morning, really perfect, um, great skill set for me and just kind of combined all of the um, the things that I love doing. So. Um, very similar to Howard, actually. I was at an MIT Sloan alum and that fell into alumni relations. I was the president-elect of our local alumni association board in a meeting with the dean complaining about, I was on the other side of that, we were the ones complaining, about how the school was supporting our alumni engagement efforts and the dean said, oh, we're about to hire a new person and what are you doing? And then you know, the conversation <laughs> happened, and I ended up leading the Global Alumni Program at Sloan for about three and a half years. At the end of that, uh, McKinsey called me up out of the blue. I'm a McKinsey alum. I had stayed in touch with my predecessor, and she said, well, would you think about coming back to the firm? And I thought that I was sort of done with alumni relations, and I am so glad that I'm still in it, and it is absolutely fantastic on the other side in the, in the corporate space. Um, different, but really, really fun. So I've been in my role at McKinsey for about eight years now. So you can, can you talk a little bit about who you report to and any performance-based metrics that are in place for your performance? Um, uh, and let us know a little bit more about that. Sure. So um, my, t um, my boss reports into the chief of staff of the firm. Um, we, are, we sit within the executive office um, at Goldman alongside the marketing team, press team, um, investor relations, government affairs. Um, so we're very lucky that we have kind of direct access to senior leadership, which I think is very important um, and a real, you know, real champions within, within that team. Um, so, yeah. Okay. So um, I am part of the global communications group at McKinsey. Uh, the partner that oversees our group reports directly to our managing director. In terms of metrics, there's sort of two things that we look at. How do we serve alums and how do we serve the firm? On the alumni side, it's all about supporting the network, um, sharing knowledge, and supporting alums' career advancement. So that's how we measure ourselves in terms of how successful we are making those things happen. On the firm side, it's are we helping catalyze alums to be good ambassadors? Huge, huge advantage there to having a vibrant alumni community that we can point to as we're on campus recruiting probably from most of your schools. Um, the second area is around the people aspect. Uh, McKinsey is an up or out organization, so what that means is that you know, each year uh, consultants are evaluated and either they move up to the next level or they leave. Uh, well, having a really vibrant alumni community to help them transition is a really, really good thing. They end up getting great jobs when they leave us and they're very happy alums. And then the third area is around client service and what are we doing to help engage our alums to better our client service. So tapping this network of 30,000 former consultants around the world to help do better with our client service. So I hope that is, th th those were the main So things. you had, in 2013, you had 225,000 apply for a job there, and only 1% got a job. So you're getting the best of the best. We like to think so. Right. Um, it's, it's, uh, and I, I frequently joke that if I were, were applying now, it might be a little bit harder than it was when, uh, when I, and, and you probably say this about the schools as well, right? It's just gotten much, it seems to have just gotten harder across the board. Um, I, what, I would, what I take away from that and what makes me really happy is that that's the future alumni, mm -hmm. right? And so to the extent that we're still able to sort of attract the best and brightest, after a few years of great experiences at the firm, 
they go on in, out into the world, into the private sector, the public sector, and the social sector. So um, I'm happy about that. One of the other things that we look at very hard is our offer acceptance rate, which uh, hit an all-time high this past year. So. See, Lula, you, you joined in 2007, and it's an interesting time with 2008 coming in Goldman Sachs, and just a lot of things happening there for you in terms of the firm yeah. and the economy, et cetera. How did that impact your work? Um, it was definitely an interesting time, and I was actually, when I joined the team, I was relatively junior, and um, within about a year, I was pretty much the only person on the team and, and was running it. Um, so just trying to figure out in those, we also lo let a lot of people go in 2008, 2009, trying to figure out how to communicate with alumni. Um, what was the message? We had to be so conscious of, you know, some people Some people had been leaving voluntarily, a lot had not been leaving voluntarily. Um, and just how did we, um, how did we communicate with them in, in a um, kind of thoughtful way that meant that even though we had let them go with, from the firm, we still wanted to keep them engaged. We still valued their, the relationship with them. Um, and so we really, you know, it was, we didn't kind of tiptoe around it, obviously. And we had a couple of alumni who um, maybe emailed us who weren't so happy at that point and a few unsubscribes. Um, but we really thought carefully about just um, reaching out to them slowly and, and gently and kind of reminding them why they, they liked the firm, why they enjoyed working there. Um, and what they were going to get from um, maintaining their relationship with us. So, you know, this morning we heard quite a bit about um, uh, development and alumni relations and the role they play and the challenges alumni relations is facing in terms of maintaining our role and, and, and working, but yet at the same time working collaboratively with development. Do you, either one of you have any perspective on that? Well, I have an academic perspective and then my perspective at McKinsey. Um, when I came in to the alumni program at Sloan, it was completely 100% focused on you know, building alumni engagement because it was frankly a turnaround situation at the time. Um, at McKinsey, a lot of people assume that we do alumni relations and it's very commercially oriented, that it's all about getting new clients. And we do have alums who become clients. It is not something I track. I couldn't even tell you who they are. Um, which is really nice. We really focus on the long term and knowing that if you, know, you get that long term engagement, you build a strong community and, and, all, and good things happen. Um, but we don't really have the equivalent of a development arm. Uh, I would say that the sort of equivalent push that we have within our organization is this notion of the short term versus the long term. You know, so a practice might want to ask alums a certain question um, and I have to say, well, you know, are they going to feel more, are they going to feel closer to the firm as a result of you sending this message? And if the answer is no, then I'm going to try and figure out a different way to work with them to help them achieve their goal um, while also building that long-term engagement. So um, we, I can tell you kind of who our alumni clients are and I could probably get you the revenue. Um, for them, but we don't. We're not measured on how much business we're bringing into the firm. We don't have a PNL. We're a team of somewhere between two and four, depending on how you look at it. Um, and where it's not our responsibility to, to bring the um, to bring business to the firm. There are hundreds of, and thousands of people walking into the firm every morning, worrying about their clients and bringing business in and getting new clients. Um, and so we're not we're, we're not held to. Um, that's not kind of a responsibility of ours. Um, so we support the business, we work incredibly closely with them, um, but we're, we're, not, um, that's, we're not charged for that. Yeah. So let's talk about engagement. What does engagement look like in, in, in for each of you in terms of structure? You know, we have clubs, many, many of us have clubs, chapters, we reach out to them, we do events. I mean, how does that work in terms of the corporate firms and how you engage them? That's fine. Okay. Um, so there, there are three things that we look at for alums in terms of how we serve them. One is around, um, are we doing a lot to build the network? And one of the things at the, at the center of any successful network is data. Um, so we pay a lot of attention to, do we have email addresses? How many, what percent of our emails, uh, of our alums do we have email addresses for? What percent open those messages? How is the long-term trend there? Um, and then, you know, how complete are profiles? Those are all things that if you don't know that, it's really tough to identify affinity groups or identify ways to engage. Moving beyond that, uh, we do other things around the supporting the network, 
that are more focused on events. So we have uh, over 100 offices around the world. Almost every one of those offices does at least one alumni event. I think this year it'll probably be closer to 200 events that are gonna take place around the world. That's not my team organizing those because I'd, I'd have a team like yours if I had to do that many events. <laughs> but uh, no, but in all, in, in all seriousness, every office has somebody who has a partial responsibility for those kinds of activities. Um, in terms of the knowledge, we actually have a very focused global knowledge sharing program and we look at what kind of attendance do we get um, and more importantly, what, what kind of content are we sharing with our alums? So in two weeks, uh, I'm going to be hosting our 172nd Global Knowledge Webcast uh, on women in the economy. Uh, we did some work with the LeanIn, uh, leanin.org, which is Sheryl Sandberg's uh, group. Uh, it was recently written up in the Wall Street Journal and we'll have five of the partners who led the work uh, on live video uh, sharing this with, with our alums. And one of the things that we started about a year and a half ago was we let alums invite guests. If any of you would like to be my guest on December 2nd, be happy to uh, have you, so you just drop an email. And then the third piece around career <coughs> services, uh, we look at the number of jobs posted on the job board, the number of uh, profiles posted on the profile board, and just the overall volume. Are we getting a lot of traffic on our website? Are people coming back? And then are our clients and others who post jobs on our board happy? Uh, so we'll measure some of that stuff with, with surveys and net promoter scores. So our engagement, I would assume, actually, is very similar to the way that you guys communicate. Um, we have a website we work with. Um, we, we work with a vendor in the US who is um, a very big in the higher education space. Um, similar to you guys, they can log in, director events, all of that type of thing. A lot of our engagement is through emails as well. And we probably don't do as much targeting as people think, honestly. Our, um, our approach to communications um, and to the network generally kind of mirrors the way that we communicate and we think about employees within the firm. So within the firm, we send a lot of tool communications um, about anything going on, really. And we've really tried to kind of mimic that to alumni as well. So we're probably sending out a tool communication, which means basically to all of the firm or to all of the alumni, um, on average, maybe once a week, once every two weeks, just letting them know what's going on at the firm. Um, obviously, we also do events like all of you. They're kind of, uh, they're generally split between um, the retired partners, um, which is a group of about 700 people who are obviously former partners of the firm, and then the rest of the alumni population, which is about 70,000. Um, and so, obviously, there's a much higher touch with the retired partners than there is with um, the rest of the population. Um, we do some events through my team centrally organized. As I said, we have a really small team, so we tend to do um, smaller kind of content focused events like breakfast briefings, that type of thing. Um, and then the other types of events are more grassroots driven, so it's a business or a department or a division coming to us and saying that they want to re-engage with their alumni, how do they do it, Ask, you know, asking for our help, and, and then um, it's really owned by that team. So, you know, in the U.S., many of us are working with the career centers much more closely than we've done in the past. And mentoring, like we're building with Graduate, is so important to help uh, the students as well as for alumni to help one another. Do you have, either one of you, have any mentoring that's going on with your, with your alums? At McKinsey, I would just say it's, it's completely baked into the culture from day one. <laughs> so you'll get a buddy who's going to help you sort of onboard. Um, there's a lot of apprenticeship. You know, all the work that McKinsey does is largely project-based, so you'll have a project leader and you get a lot of apprenticeship uh, as part of that experience. Um, and then finally, in terms of alums serving in, in more of a mentoring capacity, we will bring back senior partners to serve as faculty uh, at our training, and we do a lot of training. So, you know, it, and it's very tenure-based, so your first year you're going to go through this, 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 and this, and you know that. <coughs> Second year, these other things, and we will bring in uh, former senior partners mostly, but then sometimes speakers who maybe were only with us for a few years but are now in an industry that that particular training is focused on. 
So we don't do any official mentoring. We don't have any official mentoring programs, um, but I think it's just, it's so so much a part of the culture of the firm and it's so ingrained in, in what we do and, and the relationships that people have anyway. So if we have an alum back to the firm or you even hear them, you know, I'll hear people speaking on the radio and they'll they'll mention three or four retired partners or, or mentors or people that hired them or, or they worked for, um, that it's just, it's very, it's constantly going on anyway. Um, we don't do it formally. Um, but just very integral to the firm. We do one program not for alumni, sorry, we, we do do one program where we actually, um, alumni are acting as mentors to um, recently, uh, recent veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan. So we partnered with an organization called American Corporate Partners um, and they, um, they, they pair, we don't get involved, but they pair up the alumni um, with recent veterans. It's a minimum of a year. Um, they meet with them a minimum of once a month, but it's an incredibly, been an incredibly popular program, um, both from the alumni side and from the veteran side. Uh, so we do, we do try and encourage them to do that. And, and one thing that I'd add, and so in addition to my role at McKinsey, I'm, um, I've been on the board of the MIT Sloan Alumni Association in Boston for the last 15 years. One of the things that we, we've started looking at mentoring a little bit as a separate chapter slash association, and we found that it's, it's actually a little bit easier to get mentoring groups together, almost like peer coaching, than to try and arrange lots and lots of one-on-ones. Uh, whereas if you can get 15 people together and in any given monthly meeting, 10 of them show up, they can all help each other. And it, it, it's a little bit lower of a, um, of a workload in terms of managing that kind of an offering, yet you still get a lot of the benefits. So I just wanted to make sure I plug that on the academic side. So there was a question asked earlier today, I thought it was a good question about what keeps you up at night, what are the challenges. I mean, for, for Tulane, for all my relations there, we have greater expectations. We're moving into a $1.2 billion campaign, um, but yet we haven't really received more resources in terms of budget to do that. Well, how does that translate in terms of your the firm and what your, what your challenges are right now in terms of what keeps you up at night? I would imagine it's really similar things to what keeps everybody else at, up at night, um, resources and data. Honestly, those are kind of my two, the two pain points, the two things that you know I spend the most time thinking about. Um, resources, we, as I said, we're a small team, so we really have to kind of leverage people um, around the firm, throughout the regions. Um, we have a lot of people, we're very lucky that we work through the executive office, so a lot of people within, um, say, in London or Frankfurt or Hong Kong, Tokyo, they'll, they'll help us on events, so that's really how we've tried to get around that one. Um, and the data, we had the conversation this morning. I mean, every meeting that I go to, this is something that comes up. It's, you know, I think it's always going to be a constant issue. Um, I'm not sure that anybody has quite managed to figure that one out, but it definitely is, it keeps you on your toes. And building on those points, on the data front, um, one of the things that we launched about a year and a half ago now was a professional profile board that was uh, very focused on, again, helping our alums advance their careers. And we have a lot of clients who like to hire our alums, so there's a real offering there. But what we tried to do was link it very closely to the profiles themselves, so that now, as an alum, if you update your profile, you have a much higher likelihood of getting called for a potential role. Um, so, you know, coming back to that data point, figuring out how do you get some um, synergies between a product offering that you might have, say, something around careers, and what you need to get in return, something around data. I'm sure the communications is a bit different. I mean, we are just expanding, ever expanding our social media tools mm. to communicate in many different ways. How does that work with, uh, with the firms in terms of social media? Well, I, you know, I would say that there's a lot of really valuable data out there. Uh, you know, and invariably, if you want to try and find one alum, you can almost always look them up on the web and find something about them. But the challenge comes in, how do you look at that on a macro basis, right? Because you're not just looking at one alum, you're trying to say, what are my segments? How engaged are they? So we leverage, um, you know, things like LinkedIn and other social media to find lost alumni, right? Uh, we will reach out to them and say, hey, you know, your email address is no longer working. Do you still want to be connected? And invariably they say yes, and then they're back into the fold. So that's really, really helpful. 
Um, the, other, the other thing that we've done is we've worked closely with our recruiting team. There's a site called Real Life at McKinsey. So a lot of the alumni stories that we've been able to celebrate have been really helpful to us in terms of the message that you know, a career at McKinsey, however brief it might be, even if it's a couple years, is gonna really help accelerate your career. So most of the social sharing that we've been doing has been working closely with our recruiting team. And you know, I did the same thing with admissions when I was at MIT Sloan. It's a, it's a really good way to sort of prove the value without having to sort of show dollar signs. So. Kind of similar. Um, we, we try and leverage the firm's social media a lot. Um, we don't have an official LinkedIn page currently. Um, we are interestingly looking at Facebook um, rather than LinkedIn, um, which is definitely a departure, I think, from some of the other, some of, that, some of our other colleagues. Um, so, you know, a lot of folks like to hear best practice. What's the most successful thing you feel you've been able to do at the firm or you're most proud of since you've been there? You want to go? <laughs> sure. I mean, I have. I, actually, we've mentioned a couple of them. Um, I'm really proud of the way that we got through the financial crisis, actually. That was um, a, a di really difficult time for, for the firm and for, you know, especially for alumni. My boss used to joke that we were the only growth area of the firm in 2009. <laughs> um, so that was really challenging. You know, 2010 was the SEC, and then 2012, I'm sure a lot of you read about Greg Smith resigning in the New York Times. Um, so that has been, that was a really challenging kind of five years for us. So I'm, I'm pleased that we got through that. We have, um, we have great engagement with alumni. Um, or, you know, we think we do for the things that we measure. Um, and definitely, you know, the fact that people are still proud, proud to have been at Goldman and speak highly of us, um, I'm, I'm proud of. So when I came in, we had a very strong alumni community, but our alumni relations efforts were very, sort of uh, diversified, we'll say. They were all over the place, and they were driven primarily by our offices. We didn't have a monthly communication that we shared with alums. Um, we didn't have any kind of ongoing global knowledge events. Everything was taking place in what we call the cells. Cells would either be offices or practice areas, say financial services. Um, so the things that I'm most proud of, one of them was that when I came in, I think we had hosted six uh, webcasts at that point. And our work with the practices had always been very focused. So like the strategy practice would have a strategy session and they'd say, we only want to invite alums who have checked the box that they're interested in strategy. I said, well, wait a minute. There's a lot of other alums out there who may not have checked that box who could be interested. Can we expand it? Well, what if there's a competitor on it? I said, no, no, no. Dial back the presentation, but let's, let's tell everybody. So one of the big changes that we made was more around perception than anything else, which is, you know, when you're doing stuff, you've got to figure out a way to squeeze as much as you can out of it in terms of goodwill that you build with your alums. And so we went from a very, very targeted, maybe invite a couple thousand people, to inviting 30,000 people to these global web events. And now we're doing our 172nd uh, in a couple weeks. And the impact that that's had in terms of being able to engage alums on a global scale has been really, really good. The other thing that we, that we did was we really doubled down on our data and made some pretty significant investments in making sure that we could reach alums and then really measure, are they opening their messages? Are we driving traffic to the website? What are the areas that are, you know, so getting more insights in terms of, are we driving engagement the way we want to? So, so, oh, no, I was just going to say, so Sean got two, so I'll tell you one other thing that I'm really proud of. Um, the fact that being such a, Goldman Sachs is very centralized in some ways, um, but we are, because my team is so small and because we really have to use um, everybody in the regions, we've really tried to, um, it's really had to be kind of an organic growth. And so we've tried at the beginning, we kind of tried to, to push people to do events and we were going around the firm and we would talk about it so much, but people, they won't really do it until they get it. And at that point, they'll call you up and they'll ask you. Mm -hmm. And just something that kind of popped into my head was, we had a reunion in Taiwan last year. There are 150 alumni in Taiwan and we had 80 of them in in a restaurant for a reunion. I think that's fantastic. And the head of Asia Pacific was there as well. He's a real champion for, our, for the alumni network. 
Um, and just really having these kind of regional, you know, I, I know that a lot of you guys have a lot of alumni in a lot of different countries, and, and we do as well, but we're, we're, very, we're very big city um, focused, and so to be able to have these regions running events like that and to empower them to, to really feel ownership over their alumni um, is something that we've worked hard on for the past few years. Okay. So I'll tell you what I'm most proud of since I, I've been at Tulane for three years. Um, we didn't have a, um, a specific class year reunion program when I arrived uh, three years ago. Um, so everybody came back. It was a great opportunity for alums to come together, but it was a very small turnout. So the first year we did it, we had a little under 1,000. Um, last year, we had 3,200. And this year, we had 4,500. And, and, and I have to say, going back to collaborations, it was a, uh, the uh, Office of Alumni Relations runs the, uh, the class um, reunions, but we work collaboratively with the development. Uh, so their numbers also went up in terms of giving. But that's been a real, real big success for us. So you were in education institution, and then you went to the firm. If you were walking back into MIT right now, would you do anything differently that you did there? Or would you, would you, what if you, you feel like you learned anything from that outside experience? You know, I, I, I can compare and contrast. You know, the biggest difference in going from a central, um, you know, a central campus to a consulting firm with 120 offices around the world is that you could be on the phone at any hour of day and, you know, you, you, you don't have that sort of central energy, right, where, like, on campus you've got the faculty and the students and, like, and, 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 your, and your colleagues and the buzz is just incredible. I, I enjoyed that a lot while I was there. I sometimes miss that um, in, in the corporate space. Um, the flip side to that is that um, making the resource case is a little bit easier. Um, and you know, even though we're not tracking directly any kind of business, because that's not what we're trying to affect, um, you know, as long as we can prove the case, like this is how it's going to affect engagement, we can typically figure out a way to make, you know, make the resources happen. So, you know, would I have done anything differently, you know, having spent the eight years at McKinsey? No, I mean, the things that we launched at MIT, you know, alumni magazine, new website, those things were all things that I would have done. Would I have done them faster? I might have, but, you know, as it was, I was being told that I was working McKinsey hours at, you know, nonprofit pay, and then I had the equation back, you know, wrong when I was at uh, MIT. And I, I think that uh, overall, it was, uh, it, was a, it was a great experience. And you know, I've, I've not toyed with the idea of going back, but, um, but I've definitely stayed very connected to the university. Very good. So you know, networking is so important for us on campuses yeah. now. And it means so much to alums and students and others. Does networking mean anything to new ta getting new talent for the, the, your, your firms? Or how does, what does networking do for you in terms of um, your alumni and your, your firm? <laughs> so we're, um, we're really upfront with our recruits about what our alumni community means, right? And I think anybody thinking about taking a role at, at McKinsey or any you know, professional services firm is going to be aware that you know, they're typically pyramid structures and you know, you, you, six people come in and one make partner or eight people come in and one make partner. So there's no shame in leaving and becoming an alum. Um, so, you know, I, I would say that um, we leverage the network in the sense that someone who's worried, like, well, why would I go to a two-year role at a consulting firm when I could go to a tech company or I could go and do this? Um, what we try to do is to say, look, your career will get an extra inflection point if you come work here. You're going to learn great stuff, you're going to work with great people, and you're going to leave with a great network. Oh, that great network, tell us more. And then, you know, we've got these proof points. We have uh, 450 alums, give or take, who are the CEOs of billion dollar companies, right? We have another 100 alums who are either, you know, similar leaders in the social and uh, public sectors. We've got a couple governors in the, in the US, the head of the treasury here in the UK. Just, you know, it's, it's a really, really nice mix of alums who've gone on to great leadership roles. So I, I, does that answer your question? We're, it's, we're not as open for some reason yet about the upper art culture, and so it, it's harder to, harder to do that. But we definitely try and talk about alumni internally within the firm. We talk about a lifelong relationship. Um, you know, we're trying to get it in as soon as they, they come into the firm, so they really appreciate it. I assume in a similar way to the way that universities work. Um, 
not will be there soon, I hope. So a number of folks talked about affinity groups, and we at Tulane also are really exploding in terms of the affinity groups, whether it's affinity groups, club chapters. Uh, do you segment your populations in any way where you actually focus and target specifically related to certain generational or demographic, any other demographic you know, related kind of information that you use to bring folks together or to target folks? We, we try to have a base level of engagement that takes place throughout the global community, um, regardless of what tenure you left at. So at McKinsey, you could be anywhere from a business analyst who is you know, right out of undergrad, spent a couple of years at the firm, to a senior partner who we call directors, who might have retired from the firm after 30 or 35 years. Um, they're all invited to the sort of bait, to the main alumni events that our offices hold. In terms of other segments and other things that we'll do, we will do some things for former partners. They're a special group. It's hard to become a partner, and especially our, our former senior partners. We do some things around communication there, um, some special messages from our global managing director just to those former senior partners. Um, in terms of other segments, we work very closely with those cells. We've got about 40 different practice cells in, you know, in um, functional areas like strategy um, or digital, uh, and then in, in um, industry sectors, it could be financial services, um, could be oil and gas, what have you. And we will create uh, and we will work with those practices to identify alums who might be of interest to that particular cell. So for example, last week I was in Chicago, we had a strategy conference for a bunch of um, chief strategy officers and about 20 to 25 percent of the attendees are usually McKinsey alums. Now they're CSOs at really big companies, they just happen to be McKinsey alums and it's a sort of great opportunity to do informal focus groups, but we helped the practice identify those people. Again, very similar to what Sean said. Um, we uh, focus a lot on the, or we, we tend to segment a lot by um, retired partner and former managing director um, within the firm. And we do a, a number of events and different types of communication to them. Um, and then exactly the same work with specific teams within the firm um, who want to do events or, or divisions, departments. And one thing that I'd add, just in the academic context, right? You all have faculty that you're working with. And the more you can make them aware of what alums can do for them to either help further their research through a survey panel that you might help them create, or just to get the message out, um, you know, the, the more you'll have that sort of backup from the people who are pretty important in terms of the running of your school, right? And so, you know, I, what we do with the cells, where I have a conversation with the global head of the strategy practice, you could do the same thing in terms of major research areas where your faculty are you know, driving new, new research and you can help them get the word out and leverage alums as, um, you know, as, as ambassadors for you. So you mentioned strategy and um, we at, uh, on the campuses are now charged with really um, coming up with uh, metrics. Uh, so it's very metrics driven. Um, so we um, we have to, we, so we started with a strategic plan. So we do a strategic plan, three-year plan, with a scorecard that we look at at the end of the year, we evaluate it every year. Out of the strategic plan, we do an annual operations plan, again, with metrics that we look at at the end of each year. How does that work in terms of your areas, in terms of operational plans, metrics? We have a board that, you know, that we actually share that responsibility with. Those boards are different. Some are advisory boards, some are fiduciary mm -hmm. boards, governing boards. But we basically, we try to share that responsibility with them so there's a role for them in terms of understanding their role for the, the strategy that's put forward. Can you talk a little bit more about that in terms of the work you do? So we don't have, we were speaking earlier about this, we don't actually have um, a, a kind of alumni board or, or anything like that. Um, a lot of our we have kind of scorecards internally within within our group and the <laughs> <Are you doing? laughs> um, honestly a lot of the way that we measure things um, a lot of it is qualitative are the senior leaders involved in in our in our um, in the program happy with it are they getting complaints from the senior people from the senior alumni it's kind of a slightly um, unique uh, thing that we have. Um, 
but we're not kind of measured on, I mean, we measure a lot of the, the KPIs and the scorecards, but we're not, it's not something that we're um, accountable for from senior leaders. In terms of setting our strategy, you know, at least once a year we try to sort of reflect on, okay, are alums still wanting what we think they want? And does the firm still want what we think the firm wants? And then where's the intersection between those two? And how do we get that stuff done you know, in a minimally resource intensive way? And so this is where some of those synergies come into play, right? If you've got an opportunity to help partners help their clients hire alumni, well, you're checking the box that you're helping transitioning consultants leave, you're helping alums you know, either repot themselves or find a new adva you know, advancement opportunity. Um, at the same time, you're making the clients happy. Um, so that's good for McKinsey because we always want to make our clients very happy, but it's also good for the alums that we're serving. So we, every year we try to come back to, okay, has any of that changed, right? Has, you know, has social media obviated the need for directory? Not yet. Um, you, you know, the jury's still out, but not yet. And do we still need that data in order to be effective, um, you know, to effectively communicate with our alumni community? Yes, we do. Okay, so what do we do there? Um, you know, the same thing with looking at whether or not alums are opening up their messaging, right? Because if they're not, or if that's a decreasing um, number, we got to do something different, right? Are our subject lines working? Are we doing good A-B testing? A lot of those kinds of things are more tactical, but at the high level, making sure that what alums want and what the firm wants are intersecting, and then that we're, we're going after that. In all honesty, it doesn't change dramatically year to year, but it's just good to reflect on. Good. So, we're going to uh, have some questions from the audience, but before we do that, any final advice or comments, final comments before you, we turn it over to some questions from the audience? I think one of, the, one of the main things that I've realized over the past few years, um, and when we first launched the network, I think we were very focused on alumni. What did they want? What could we give them? Um, and then I think it kind of transitioned a little bit into, wow, what can we get from the alumni? Because you know, we were talking, right. we're not raising money in the same way as, as, or we're not fundraising in the same way as a lot of people in here are. Um, and I think in the past couple of years, we've really come to a much better equilibrium about it. And whenever I speak to somebody that's launching a program, I tell them the, the one of the things that I would really keep in mind, and I, I'm sure a lot of you kind of bear this in mind as well, but just to really, just always kind of balance that, like 50-50, you know, there's always that kind of constant pull and push, like what are we getting from the alumni and what are they getting from us and what do they want from us and just always always keeping that in mind with what we do and it doesn't always have to be exactly equal, sometimes you know a lot of the time I'll try and give them what they want so that when I want to make that ask, um, you know it, it's there and I kind of have it in my back pocket, um, but I, I always try and remember that. Um, I would say have fun and focus on the long term if you can uh, and you know, this, this whole notion of just thinking, thinking through the short-term, the, the long-term implications of some of the short-term activities that you might have to do day to day. And, you know, is that building long-term engagement? Is that building a strengthened community over the long-term? And sometimes it's hard, like if you're, you know, you've got some metrics that you're trying to reach, but you should also be looking at the long-term. Um, because that's really what we're all about, right? These relationships are not transactional, or they shouldn't be. Um, and even, and I'm gonna sort of veer off a little bit in terms of the development discussion, one of the things that always astounds me is when, um, when I receive, and I get the, I've gotten these from MIT, um, you know, a dedicated annual fund communication, right? I know that, you know, let's just say it's 35% is the giving rate, right, at, at Sloan. That means 65% of the people who get that message do nothing with it. They don't give. Yet, we're sending a message that is so focused on that particular area of engagement, and we're running the risk of alienating them, right? Because if you're an alum in that 65% that isn't writing a check to the annual fund, that message isn't necessarily gonna convert you. What's gonna convert you is you feel engaged, you feel connected to the school, and you wanna do more. So one little sort of thing that I, I've tried to emphasize is this notion of a comprehensive offering for engagement. So it could be, hey, this is the annual fund, but we also have, you know, here's a way you can volunteer, here's another thing you can do at, at the school, post a job, like giving them a suite of opportunities that they can engage on so they don't feel like you're just asking about money. 
And I'm not saying that you all do that. I'm sure you're more times than not trying to protect against it. But just being able to sort of broaden the discussion and broaden that engagement to say, how do you get to them the way they want to be gotten? And some people are just perfectly happy to write a check, but they might have more to offer beyond that check that they're not giving now. Like they might be able to hire five of your graduates and the 500 bucks that they gave or 5,000 might be helpful, but tweaking your numbers by five extra great jobs for your graduates might be even more powerful. So just thinking about that you know, a little bit more broadly. So for me, um, I've been at four institutions and I think the whole issue of being relevant is so important. Uh, what, are, what are we doing to help to get the best students through admissions? You know, what are we doing to make a better student life for student affairs to get uh, alums involved to help come back and talk to the students? What are we doing with the career centers to help internships be created, opportunities there? How are we, if you have athletics, how, how are we working with our good friends in, in athletics to help folks be, uh, be there in terms of the tailgates, et cetera? And lastly, how are we helping development in terms of uh, helping them increase their numbers but at the same time protect the, uh, the role we play in that, in that, uh, that work. So um, if we can ask, ask some questions, uh, please feel free to put your hand up and we'll call you out. Um, so part of it for me is emphasizing the fact that you know, alums have a lifelong relationship with the firm so that someone who leaves us after just two years, they're at the very, very early stage of their career. And you know, the ways they're going to be helpful to the firm at that point in their career versus 15 years later is very different. It evolves over time. But that it's very, very important to engage them throughout. Because if you wait until they quote unquote hit it big, it's too late. Right? Like, you know, you're only talking to me because I hit it big. That's, that's what is going on in their heads. And so emphasizing with leadership this notion of it's, it's a lifelong commitment and a lifelong connection. Uh, and then saying, here are engagement metrics that are reflective of that long-term um, connection building. Does that answer your question? Get this one. Hi, Abba Corte from Achieving. Um, so we are a scholarship program, and our USB for recruiting new scholars, as opposed to people going on other scholarship programs like Fulbright or DARD, is what you mentioned for McKinsey about this great network that they'll be joining. Um, what I want to ask is, how do you turn that, that, that thing into reality for your recruits? Because for us, like your CEOs, I'm sure they're all busy people. How do you then translate this idea of you're joining a great network to a reality to help your alumni maximize that once they finish. Because for us, they can't have all that direct contact with, say, people who are now ministers or senior in business. It's, it's harder to get those people engaged. We're more engaged with the more recent alumni. Um, so I just, I just wonder how you deal with that. Um, so, it, so just to make sure that I'm clear on the question, it's more about how do you engage that tippity top of your network, right? Yeah, the really. To, to bring benefit, if you told people that this is why you should join the community, network, how do you make that reality for them that they can actually access it? So one of the ways we do that um, is we'll have alumni <laughs> speak both at recruiting events and a lot of our training events. Um, I still remember when I was a cons an early consultant the then CEO of Arrow Electronics spoke about his time, he's now a professor at HBS, um, you know, spoke about his time at the firm and how he leveraged that into advancing his, you know, his career into being a CEO of a, a major corporation. So we, we try to do some of that in-person stuff. Um, another thing that we do is we do a lot of celebration. So last year we um, celebrated over a thousand alumni stories in the news on our website. It's a pain to track that, right? It takes a lot of work, but it really pays dividends because now our recruiting team knows here are all these people who got all these great appointments. We feed that into our data segmentation so that now when you know, someone from this law school wants someone with that profile, 
we can sort of return that almost instantaneously to say, here's five people that fit that bill that'll help you recruit. Um, but in terms of engaging those really, really senior alums, there's also special stuff that we'll invite them to, like next week, um, we have a Financial Times uh, McKinsey Book of, uh, Business Book of the Year Award, which I guess was Goldman's before ours, so. <laughs> um, Thanks for the comment. <laughs> and, uh, and we are only inviting really, really senior alums to that. About a month ago, uh, the McKinsey Global Institute celebrated its 25th anniversary. We had three former, two former managing directors there, um, three former chairs of the McKinsey Global Institute, including one who is now the chair of the J.P. Morgan Chase Institute. So we will bring them together uh, in other ways uh, and in terms of making it apparent to our current people how to leverage them and, and to our alums how to leverage them. That's mostly through our communications and a little bit with events. Does that answer your question? Great. Uh, hi, John Dillon from uh, Trinity College Dublin. Uh, very interested in the webcasts and your, what you say, 175th or something webcast coming up. So I'm sure you've learned a lot from your first one to your 175th and it's an ideal thing that institutions should be doing as obviously areas of education, but having, having pushed a few out, you know, the academics being academics, they tend to be, you know, over a, over a number of weeks that these webcasts might be run. So. I suppose I'm interested in what, what your key learnings would have been in terms of what's the ideal length of a webcast, what's the ideal time of day, and sure. also do, do you mix between alumni doing webcasts themselves versus you know, the actual uh, staff? So just so a few tips great. on webcasts. Yeah, so, so very tactically, um, we do about 24 of these sessions a year, right? So two a month. Two, four, 24, so two a month. Um, and we try to book them out two to three months in advance, which allow us to get multiple marketing cycles, for lack of a better word. So we like to try and get them into at least two newsletters. What that means is that we've got to get our you-know-what together to know what new research is coming up. So I'm very close to the, um, the head of the McKinsey Quarterly, the, you know, the chairs of the McKinsey Global Institute, and then our practices. And over time, what ends up happening is they get to know the webcast program as a channel that they can leverage where they start thinking, I gotta call Sean. Um, so part of it is sort of getting that flywheel spinning, right? Because once you have that, then people will come to you. In terms of the practicalities, we do 75 minute sessions with a 15 minute buffer on the back end. Typically, we get them done in 75 minutes. Um, I manage all of those. Now, there's different ways you can approach this. You can do open mic, which is anyone can ask any question they want. Um, one of the challenges with that is that you can't really aggregate the questions and come out with some themes. So it's actually fairly involved, but fun to get you know, 50 questions in front of you through a text chat and figuring out, okay, here are the four broad themes. I'm gonna make sure that each one of these gets asked and, and try and always end on a, a positive note and make your presenters look awesome, right? At the end of the day, they're not gonna wanna do it again unless they were happy about the process. So we work really, really hard on that. It takes a lot of prep. So we do uh, one prep session um, for every, uh, for every uh, knowledge session that we do. We have a virtual green room for half an hour before the session where you know, things that go wrong, things that can go wrong do go wrong and we almost always can fix them. We had one where a presenter literally, like just as I was finishing my open remarks, opening remarks, finally was able to connect, right? He started trying half an hour beforehand. And that's why we do that. So little things like that, and usually at about uh, 70 minutes, if we have tons and tons of questions, I'll say to the audience, look, you committed for 75, but our presenters have offered to stay longer. Um, if you wanna stay longer, that's great. And we look, we look at what our uh, retention rate is over time. Um, and then you're, you had another question about alumni and whether, to, whether or not to bring them in. Because we only have 24 slots a year, um, we try to focus on priority knowledge topics for the firm. And if we've got another alum who's got something interesting to say on that front, especially if they're bringing something very practical, and I'd imagine this would be a perfect opportunity for you, right? So you find, at, find the top five research areas for your faculty, and then find an alum who is actually doing that stuff, and get them to present together. 
where the faculty member talks about their new cutting edge research and then the alum says, well, this is how I might use that. Where they've talked about it beforehand, so the, the alum isn't like putting it down. But, you know, but the alum can say, you know, here's, here's what I'm taking away from this and how I'm going to use this as a leader of an organization in this space. Um, so there's a lot you can do with that. We generally don't have alum solo presenters. They're, if, if they are going to talk, usually they've got a book that's been published. We have uh, an alum who has a book that's going to be out in two months called How to Have a Good Day. Um, and, and, it's, 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 and I've read the galley, it's awesome, but we're gonna have someone from our org practice co-present to say this is what the implications are for getting this done in an organization and this is the micro of how you have a good day leveraging behavioral psychology and things like that, so. I think we have time for one more question. Hi, Natasha from the BBC again. Um, yeah, I wondered how aware your existing staff are of the fact that there is an alumni program available to them. Like, is it culturally embedded at McKinsey and Goldman Sachs, or is it something they learn about on the day that they, they leave, or the day they give in their notice, or? So we definitely, we don't, um, our employees aren't part of the alumni program, but we definitely, um, they're definitely aware of it. We have an internal um, kind of GS web, which is an internal um, intranet, and we have stories posted every single day. We have a lot of alumni stories on there. So whether it's something that we, we do like a best advice column with an alum possibly, or we have an alumni event, or um, we're talking about something that alumni are doing, that will be kind of one of the daily stories. And everybody logs on, that's your homepage, you can't change it, and that's the first <laughs> thing that people see. Um, and so we, we get a lot of readers for those. So people are definitely aware. We also, um, kind of duplicating our efforts, but we're trying to change this. Um, everything that we put on our alumni website, we actually replicate internally as well. So anybody internally can access this, apart from the directory, but things like the, all of the alumni and the news stories and, and about the events, that type of thing. So they're definitely aware. Um, we have a lot of alumni coming into the firm to speak. We bring them in for um, training events. We have uh, an area of the firm called Pine Street, which focuses on the very senior people at the firm and training them and we bring back the retired partners to speak to speak at those events. So we definitely, um, people at the firm are definitely aware of it before they leave, yeah. And so we talked earlier about how recruiting and alumni relations work very closely together in terms of our messaging to potential recruits. So if you're thinking about joining McKinsey, you know we've got an, an alumni community and, and that it's vibrant and, and how you can engage it. Um, we also have, uh, our alumni website is open to everybody within the firm, and our firm members are in the alumni directory. Because one of the things, and this is something that I implemented over the last two years, previously you'd log into the alumni directory and you'd only see alums, but the problem with that was that the three of us may have started together, and James might be the only one still there, and if uh, Lior and I look up each other, we'll see each other, but we won't see James and say, well, where's James? Now you can have a comprehensive view of sort of everybody. That probably isn't as relevant in the academic context because your people leave all at once, but ours leave in bits and pieces, right? They leave over time. Um, so now our alumni directory and firm member directory are together, and it gives us that you know, one more hook for why alums would want to come and, and, and see that. Um, I think that... Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah. And I, are we good, Daniel? I mean, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you have, if anyone has any other uh, questions, happy to 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 chat after this. We we'll look forward to your feedback. And um, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, good discussion. Wonderful. Wonderful. Let me. Uh, Sean made a comment about the webinars about making your presenters look awesome. I didn't have to work very hard. They were awesome. And I think just another big round of applause for James, for Laura, and for Sean. And now we're going to take a selfie. Yeah. <laughs>